First, I just want to say how good it is to be back home after traveling to Indianapolis for the Eucharistic Congress last week. It was beautiful to see 50,000 people, 60,000 people maybe even, in one place just to praise and worship our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And it's also good to be back. Uh, I just want to share with all of you that I, I had the opportunity to pray for all of you at the Chapel of St. Anne. It's right across the street from the Convention Center where most of the conferences were hosted. And I know that God worked that out in a special way because St. Anne is the patroness of our Archdiocese. As you know, we celebrated her feast day just yesterday. And she's also the mother of Mary. So I know that she has a particular love for our church and our community, which is named after her daughter. I know God also worked out our Sunday readings in a providential way because one of the main focuses of the Eucharistic Congress was the sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel. Starting next week, uh, we hear of a long discourse, a discussion between Jesus and the crowds. That forms, we might say, the second half of the sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel, but today we get the first half. We get this miracle of feeding 5,000 people with only five loaves and two fish. And so what's immediately observable about this miracle is that Jesus far surpasses the prophets and miracle workers of the Old Testament. We heard about Elisha who fed a hundred with 20 loaves, but Jesus feeds 50 times more people with about a quarter of the food Elisha had. But like everything else in life, what's immediately observable isn't the only thing that's going on here. Because miracles are a sign, and like all signs, they point to something more. Next week, we'll actually hear Jesus say to the crowds, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. So he calls them out for missing the sign. They were, they were fed miraculously, but they only looked at the food. They didn't look at the miracle. They didn't look at the sign. Because if they did, they would see what it points to. And all miracles point to at least two things. The first thing that they always point to is to the existence of a miracle worker. They point to the existence of God, who, as St. Paul tells us, is over all, and through all, and in all. This is why any serious atheist goes around trying to debunk or disprove any miracles he encounters, because if there is something that cannot be explained by nature, then there must be something or someone who is outside of or above nature. And for an atheist, that can't happen. It's not within the realm of possibility. So, miracles' first purpose, there is a God, and he works miracles. The second thing a miracle points to is more particular, more specific, depending on the circumstances. And so what does the feeding of 5,000 people point to? I think there's at least two clues we can find in our reading. The first is when St. John says, the feast of Passover was near. Because recall that one year later, at the next Passover feast, Jesus will be having his last supper with the apostles, where he institutes the Eucharist. And so our first clue we should have in the back of our mind is the Passover, the Last Supper, perhaps the Eucharist. And our second clue confirms that because in the original Greek it's quite clear, but in our English translation it's hidden a little bit. But when Jesus takes the loaves and gives thanks, he takes the loaves and Eucharistisas, he Eucharists them, is what the original Greek would tell us. It's very clearly pointing to the Eucharist. And so we see that this multiplication of bread and fish points to the Last Supper, the Eucharist, Jesus giving himself, not just bread and fish, the new Passover, the new Exodus, when God leads us not just out of Egypt, but out of sin and out of death. Now, as I said, we have a few more weeks to kind of break open and explore those realities that this miracle points to. So for now, I just want to focus on this aspect of multiplication. Because if we figured out that this miracle does point to the Eucharist, to Holy Communion, then this multiplication is also telling us something about that. The question just remains, what exactly is it telling us? Now, there are, of course, recorded cases of Holy Communion being multiplied at Masses where there were so many people, not everyone could have received Communion. That's a very clear connection to this miracle, but I suggest there's something we don't always think about. What it reminds us is that material, physical things, are normally always divided when they're shared. Whereas spiritual things are not divided, but rather multiplied when they're shared. For example, if I share my food, that's obviously less food for me.
But if I share something that is true, it remains true for me and another. It's been multiplied. If I share something that's beautiful, it remains beautiful for me and another. If I share my faith, my hope, my love with another, I don't end up with any less of those. Because when I share them, they aren't divided, they're multiplied. Now, I could simply wind up here and end it saying that we should always try to share these things with others, that Jesus gives us the necessary strength to share our faith, hope, and love, that we can't do it on our own, and that's why we need to receive his strength and communion. That is true. But I think sometimes that can feel a little abstract for us. Uh, you know, material goods, when we share them, we, we grab onto them and we let them go. So it's very easy to see that we've accomplished something. But when we share material goods, we're a little bit less sure. And so I hope to give you some practical advice um, to help that. There's many spiritual goods we could share and we could focus on, but I want to just focus on one. Give Jesus your time, and he will multiply it. Now, going to Mass on Saturday or Sunday, yes, of course, that's giving Jesus our time. But also give him time in prayer. It doesn't have to be here at our church or at any other church if that's not feasible, although there are many in the area. But do give him some time in prayer. Give him, say, two minutes for each loaf of bread and for each fish that the little boy brought to Jesus. That wouldn't even total 15 minutes. But bring that time to Jesus in prayer. He will multiply it. So that you and I can spend not just time here with him, but that we can spend eternity with him, rather than eternity away from him. For me, I like to use my phone. I like to set a timer. It's easy because it makes sure I don't fall asleep and it makes sure I'm not late for anything. Whatever you have to do, whether it's a timer or it's just having your watch with you. 15 minutes a day talking to Jesus, maybe in the morning while you're sipping a morning coffee, or 15 minutes before bed while you sit or kneel before you go to sleep. 15 minutes on a lunch break during the workday. Whenever it is, just give Jesus that time. And he will work miracles, just as he did when he multiplied the bread and the fish. Because he will multiply whatever we give him. But we have to take the time to give it to him. So let's take the time today and tomorrow and every day of our life to do so.